Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ramadan Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the Healthy Muslim in Ramadan. We're now at Iftar. Oh, this is the best time of day. And it is the time when rightfully the Muslim may be happy and Allah recognizes that he is happy. Because as he feels the effect of food after a long fast, the, the effect is really fast. Within 10 minutes, even less, five minutes, of your water and your three days, it's as if you're coming alive again. Your brain becomes clear, your eyes become brighter, you're more attentive, and yet you've eaten very little. And in the wisdom of our tradition, that's all we have before we pray. Because to get too distracted about eating more means that you're very likely to miss your maghrib prayer. So that's enough, and you can um, say your prayers, and then decide what you're going to do with the rest of the evening. You've got two considerations here. First of all, you've got to look back. What did I do today? What have I got to catch up with? Clearly, you've got to catch up with water. Is your water going to come with sugar? Because you've been doing a lot of very heavy exercise type work, in which case your muscle glycogen has got to be repleted in order for you to have, uh, first of all, to be able to pray Tarawi prayer, which is more effort, um, but also to have fuel for the following day. If you haven't done much exercise, you won't need a lot of immediate glucose. You will need, however, salt. You'll need salt because, as I've explained, you need salt to maintain your blood pressure. By anybody's end of fast, you are running out of salt and you definitely need it to get a higher blood pressure and a sense of, of more alertness. So your first meal should contain some salt and should contain protein. Protein needs to be anchored both at iftar and at suhoor because protein is the one thing that stabilizes energy. If you eat sugar, let's say honey, it goes fast into the body and fast out of it. At the end of an hour, it's all gone. If you eat protein, it doesn't even start working for an hour and it carries on working for two, three, four hours, even more. So we call that fast energy, slow energy. Carbohydrates, which are another source of energy, come in two forms. Your fast carbs is your honey, but then there's slow carbs. Slow carbs are your leafy vegetables, your grains, but not grains as white bread, pizza, spaghetti, white rice, but your real grains, barley, the, the rather more coarse grains, which go into brown pita bread and things like that, these, again, get into the body very slowly and last longer in the body. If you decided that all you wanted at Iftar was three Mars bars, oh, you feel all right for 10 minutes, then you'd, get, you'd feel very sleepy. And within three hours, you'd feel dreadful you'd feel really hungry all over again, and you wouldn't get through anything. So we have to be intelligent about what we're going to feed ourselves. So timing is everything. What are you going to do with the rest of the evening? For some people, they might be getting into a car to go to the mosque, they're going to do tarawi prayer in the mosque, and they're going to get into a car and come back. They're going to eat en need enough food at that point to keep them alert while they're praying tarawi, but not too much of your glucose because the glucose will make you sleepy. Um, if you have sugar 
as I've explained, especially after a period of fasting, you can quite literally fall asleep in the middle of sujud, which would be very embarrassing. So timing is important. When are you going to eat what and what do you, how long do you intend it to last? If you're going to be praying for a long time, eat a little bit. Eat a barley soup with some um, lamb in it. That's the traditional soup of Oman, uh, which I was first introduced to. Highly intelligent, clearly medicine of the prophet, because that gives you your protein, it gives you your salt, and it gives you carbohydrate in form of the barley in a slow form, which will get you through a decent period of prayer. When you come back, you, if you're going to do a lot for the following day, you may need to eat some more before you go to sleep, because you might feel extremely high anyway. I mean, sometimes after a fast, when the food hits you, you get a huge energy, which you bring to prayer, which is wonderful but you need something to make you sleep. At that point, you can be excused in having some pasta or some bread or a sandwich or something with a little bit more fast carbs, which are allowed to make you sleepy at that point. So timing is everything. You might be a mother with children that you know are going to be up in the middle of the night. So you will read some Quran and go to sleep with them in order to attend to them later. In that situation, you're not going to be eating a lot all at once, but maybe you won't want to be cooking later on until suhoor. So you'll give yourself a decent meal, but not with a lot of fast carbs. Avoid the rice, sweets, cakes, biscuits, ice cream, pasta, white rice at iftar. It's the wrong time to eat it. Quantity, that's also important. If you're an elderly person, you haven't done much through the day, you can't because your arthritis is troubling you, but you've been very good and you've fasted all day, you don't need to eat much. As we get older, we need to maximize nutrition and minimize calories. So the calorie nutritional balance in what you eat is extremely important. The elderly need maximum nutrition. Nutrition comes from the vast treasure of Allah's vegetable market. The vegetables and the herbs. Read Surat al-Rahman. Um, Allah is gloating about what he has given to you to eat. And all of the things that Allah describes have those on your iftar table for the people who need to max out on nutrition. Because Everything that you eat in, in vegetables and so on will make you feel great. You don't need calories, they're all low in calories, but they're very high in the things that you need to maintain good eyesight and general excellence in terms of your skin, your hair, all of your brain and other important bits of your body. It's important not to eat the same thing all the time. I do love the cooking programs for Ramadan because it shows that if you, if you really are going to explore the treasure that Allah has in store for you, you've got to look very deeply into the range of what's available. A person at the end of the fast doesn't want to eat the same thing as yesterday if he's lucky enough not to be living in the middle of a war zone where he's very lucky to get anything, but if he's living in luxury, he will want to celebrate and to thank Allah for the full range and, and pleasure of the food that is available. Allah wants us to have pleasure at iftar and at suhoor. This is the time we learn about the benefits of, of, of food and about what we can eat. Um, so for your elderly and for the children, maximize nutrition and every day think of something different. One day you'll do one vegetable, another day another. Have a variety available. People who eat always rice and potatoes, rice, potatoes, bread, rice, potatoes, bread, meat, rice, meat, bread, potatoes. You can see the effect on them. I once had a patient 
I won't identify who, but he was an extremely well-known and wealthy individual from the Middle East who had a very strong representation in the, in the UK, and he's known very well over here. And he asked me to study his nutrition, which I did some very good tests on him. And he was quite angry with me, because I pointed out that his diet, he had more money than I can imagine, but he liked rice and meat. And the rice and meat was cooked beautifully, but he didn't have vegetables and he didn't have fruit. And he was grossly deficient in a number of things that were important to his health. And he didn't like my uh, answer, didn't pay my bill either. That didn't matter because I saw that eating intelligently is not about money. You can eat very intelligently, as my friend did in, in, uh, when she was on her ashram, on one pound a day, because every day they ate from different plants, different herbs, and they ate a, an extremely healthy nutritional balance. And she said at the end of that time, she's never felt better. We'll have a break now. Uh, we'll be back in a few moments. Please come back. Welcome back. Those of you who are involved in preparing the, the iftar meal, I hope you find it useful to understand the role of food as a fuel so that as you're directing the food that you've prepared to some of the people around your table, you'll make sure that the right food goes to the right person. We've explained already about the quantity of calories you may be considering, about the timing of your iftar food from your immediate break to the food after Maghreb to the food after Tarawi before you go to sleep. Um, or if you're going to sleep earlier, you might just have one meal. And we've described in general the role of protein, the role of immediate sugar, and the role of carbohydrates altogether, the slower carbohydrates, which last longer. Saying carbohydrates, you can't go to your supermarket and ask for carbohydrates. It doesn't come in a packet that says carbohydrates. It comes in a packet that says lentils, or chickpeas, or fool, and you have to understand a little bit on what you're doing as a cook to influence what that carbohydrate has become. It's also important for the person eating the food. I've been to Muslim families, and. I might even say that one of the reasons I converted to the religion of Islam was the amazing food that is presented in any situation where people are being entertained or welcomed as a guest. And food, I think, is a great way to communicate. But it also means you have to select intelligently. And you may find in front of you lot of food, you think, what's a carbohydrate? I don't know what a carbohydrate is. I don't know what a protein is. So the immediate sugar is honey, dates, and you don't need much. That will wake you up. Then you're going to sit and have your meal. The elderly among you are going to go for the leafy vegetables, are going to go for a little meat, not much. They need a little, but they don't need that much. They store it very easily. They need the salt, so they'll need the soup to get the salt and to get the liquid. But otherwise, they'll need a little rice, very little rice, and some vegetables. The men who've been having a hard day, they need some real food. They need protein. They need the protein because it gives them energy that's really spread out. And they need carbohydrates now I'm going to confuse you again, the lentils, the chickpeas, the fool, in a solid form. 
because again, the body takes a long time to digest it and the lentil will still be working in the body two or three hours ahead. If you turn the lentil into a lentil soup, it will be used up in an hour, an hour and a half. So don't liquidize your soups. Have them in a solid form. Have chickpeas solid in the vegetable stews and things that you make. Have lentils in your dal really not terribly cooked. Have them pretty well whole. Or, of course, in the West, we like our lentils almost raw. Um, that's the way we prefer them. We have them whole, and we put them whole in, in salads and things like that. Because then, that way, the nutrition and the carbohydrate last for long, longer. That's what we call slow energy. You have your fast energy quickly, then your slow energy. If you're feeding children, you know they're going to want the sweets. Then they're going to want to absolutely eat all the sweets that are on the table, and you want to reward them. Be careful. If you start to always train a child that sweets equals love, equals reward, equals congratulations, that child will crave sweets. He will get fat. He will have a problem. Somehow we have to learn how to teach our children that the food we're giving them, of course we're going to give them sweets. Honey is lovely, but we're not going to give them too much, even though we love them to pieces. But we're not going to give them too much because it's not good for them. So when you have children at the table, be careful that they don't reach for the halva, they don't reach for the really sticky sweet things, which is part of your tradition. You're allowed one piece, not ten pieces. The tradition of these sweet things in Ramadan is important for when you've just broken your fast. After that, put them away. They should not be eaten for the rest of the night. If you eat too much, you'll get cramp, you'll get sleepy, it's the wrong thing to do. I haven't mentioned fat, which is wrong. It's interesting that in the desert areas where a range of food is, of course, more difficult to get hold of. I'm talking about uh, the range of vegetables that might be available. They're not available in the desert. But the one thing that a person will have at Suhoor in the desert is a glass of ghee, pure fat. Because for a thin person who doesn't have sugar around, they have dates, but they don't have a lot of other sources of glucose, fat is a source of energy and it's extremely good. And if somebody, if a man is going to do a lot of exercise, he's going to be building a bridge, he's on a construction site, he's really going to be doing a lot. You will need to give him ghee in the morning, you'll definitely need to give him fatty food in the evening. Whereas normally you say don't eat fat because you can't metabolize it. A person who is going to need 5,000, 6,000 calories a day, some of that calorie has to be fat. And the fat they can have in the evening when they finish their work, and they can have it in the morning as well. Um, so the type of food you're eating is extremely important. When you're considering what you're going to do for the evening, it's so easy to just think, oh, I want some food, and to, you know, your brain is so happy to have had anything. You're unconscious. Try watching different evenings, especially if you do more or less the same thing through Ramadan. Different foods, different pattern of foods, and see how you manage during your Tarawih prayer, during reading your Quran. Are you falling asleep in the middle of your recitation? Because if you are, I don't think it's fatigue. 
I think it's what you were eating and I think you should change it. If you're sleepy, next evening, don't eat so much rice. Try just having protein and vegetables and maybe some olive oil in your soup. That's a very easy way of getting fat. Um, so you start with your soup and maybe have some meat and uh, some vegetables with it and put olive oil in the soup. That's a very nice balance. You might say, what, no rice, no sweets? Well, try one night with the sweets, one night without. My guess is, unless you've had a day where you've been on a construction site, you won't need the sweets. And if you have them, you'll be falling asleep when you're meant to be reciting Quran and you're meant to be fully attentive. Because the whole point of this sudden influx of energy, having fasted, is that you bring that energy to the sensitivity of really, really, really listening to Allah, to his message in the Quran. That is the point of Ramadan, that we should understand. You can't understand if you're falling asleep. MashaAllah, I hope these little tips will have been of some help to you. Um, food is a fuel. It's a chemical, and if we learn to understand its balance, there's a great blessing in it for us. I've often been astonished by the different qualities of different types of cooking. If you have a saint in your kitchen, your Ramadan will fly. Assalamu alaikum.